Okay, I think we're live now. Hey, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome and thank you very much for joining us in our virtual conversation today, marking the 10th anniversary of the Arab Spring. Today's event is one of many we're hosting as part of the 10th edition of RightsCon, set to launch online from June 7th till June 11th, 2021. Um, this year, so since January, we've hit the 10 year mark for the revolutions in Tunisia, Egypt, and most recently, three days ago, uh, on Valentine's Day to be exact, uh, the revolution in Bahrain. As many in our audience know, uh, in late uh, 2010, early 2011, millions of citizens in the region took to the streets demanding justice, dignity, and freedom. And whilst we can commemorate the Arab uprisings for various reasons, uh, we'll delve today into one of its outstanding legacies, namely how activists and citizens utilize the internet and digital tools for political organizing and mobilization and how that looks like today. Um, so the role of the internet, uh, particularly social media companies like Twitter and Facebook uh, has often been exaggerated uh, in those uprisings. However, it is undeniable uh, that the Arab Spring has ushered in new discussions over the role of technology and its impact on our fundamental rights, from content moderation issues to internet shutdowns to surveillance and spyware. Many of those uh, discussions and issues we're still grappling uh, with um, until this moment in time. So today I'm extremely honored to be joined uh, by fantastic speakers, uh, colleagues and friends, uh, some of whom were on the front lines of those protests to reflect on the past decade. Um, we have a special session today in terms of format, so we won't have the conventional webinar uh, or panel. Instead, in this one hour and a half, uh, we'll cover a range of, of topics uh, in smaller intercessions. So we'll first uh, start with uh, Mohamed Najim, the executive director and co-founder of SMEX, to uh, reflect on the status of internet freedoms and digital rights in the region since 2011, and especially in, in light of um, Arab governments or regimes relentlessly moving to uh, close down the last pockets of, of uh, online freedoms enjoyed by citizens to speak up their minds, to communicate and share and access information openly and freely. Uh, then we'll show two videos uh, from activists in, from Libya and Tunisia. We'll then move into a conversation on content moderation issues and specifically the role uh, of big tech companies in shaping online space and how people exercise their rights uh, in the region, particularly the right to freedom of expression and opinion. We'll have with us Dia Kiyali to have that conversation. Uh, we'll also uh, discuss the issue of online surveillance and the lived experience of human rights activists who have uh, been the target of malicious and sophisticated uh, surveillance campaigns, uh, together with uh, uh, Miriam Al-Khawaja, Fuad Abdel Moumani from Morocco, and our very own Natalia from our uh, uh, tech and legal team. And uh, finally, away from over celebrating the legacy of the Arab revolutions uh, or lamenting on the calamitous trajectory they have taken, uh, we hope to use the time today uh, for us to think collectively and uh, as activists and civil society organizations to inspire action and think uh, forward uh, in ways uh, we can reclaim the internet as a free and open space for citizens and for us to exercise our rights, especially as many continue to struggle today for uh, justice and freedom uh, under dictatorships and repressive regimes uh, in Egypt, in uh, Saudi Arabia, in Morocco, in Bahrain, and as we have seen uh, most recently uh, in Tunisia. Towards the end of the session, uh, we'll have time to answer your questions. So please ask away during the session. Uh, we look forward to engaging uh, with the comments and questions you raise. Uh, one quick uh, housekeeping rule, uh, this event is being recorded and we'll provide the recording uh, on YouTube later with Arabic transcripts. And before we kick um, off the discussion, I want to say something and to get it out of my system. Uh, and that is uh, we acknowledge and appreciate uh, the complexity of the Arab revolutions and, and their aftermath, um, as well as the diversity of voices from the region. So we do not uh, claim that this conversation is conclusive nor inclusive of all the voices and issues we're facing in our region, but we hope uh, that this conversation will be start of many 
um, and, and, and we look forward to engaging with you, uh, especially uh, during RightsCon, the biggest convening uh, on the issues related to human rights and uh, technology. So uh, diving right in, uh, Mohammed, thank you so much for joining us. Just to introduce you to our audience, uh, Mohammed Najim is the co-founder and executive director of uh, SMEX, a digital rights organization based in, in Lebanon. Uh, and Mohammed, I'm, I'm going to jump straight into uh, the conversation. I, I noted that in the Time magazine this year, you were listed as uh, one of those activists still fighting uh, towards progress in our region since you founded uh, or co-founded SMEX in 2008. So you are an old veteran. You've been around before the Arab Spring and during and after. And back in the days, uh, admittingly, I was one of those people who thought that, you know, digital tools are, quote unquote, liberation tools. They definitely can help us um, democratize our societies, communicate freely, and uh, they would usher us into a new era of political uh, movement and organization. Of course, fast forward uh, where, to the point where we, we are now, the situation is a bit different. So can you share with us from your experience how um, the internet as a landscape has changed um, as well as the ways we can exercise our rights and organize uh, on the internet as well as uh, on, on the ground? Sure, uh, thank you Marwa, thank you Access Now for organizing this session. And uh, I'm very happy and honored to be with all colleagues and friends as well to be on this panel. Uh, I, I think Marwa that this feeling that the internet was a liberation space, it was a common feeling for everyone. I mean, even, uh, and, I, and I wanna go back a little bit to the 1996 when the internet, there was like a declaration of the independence of cyberspace. I mean, if, if we look at it right now, I mean, it's, it's kind of cute, you know, <laughs> but like, but like there was there was this movement of uh, we we got to a point in this region where the the normal activism is not working anymore. The security apparatus is really strong. Uh, many people are in jail, and the internet came as this new tool to play with and to dream with as well. So I was witnessing what was happening during this periods of time I actually uh, managed to 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 know how to play these games around these internet uh, I mean of course now in 2021 we look at this we, we look at this era uh, we we want to look at it in a, in a in a critical eye but we also want to look at it in a way that we, we need to understand that 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 was normal to people look at it this way and uh, and that feeling that existed during this time it it, it came naturally uh, because it came as as a saver from from something. So back in 2008, when we started using the social media tools, it was all about okay, how how we can use these tools more strategically, how we can really get to the goals we want to get, how we can achieve what we want to achieve. I mean, everyone was jumping on this uh, on these tools, and. Uh, I mean, I would say between 2008 and 2011 or 12, that was like four or five years until we started thinking about, okay, there's content moderation here that we need to talk about, that we need to understand how these tech companies work. Uh, we need to understand how we can uh, negotiate the space and what's accepted to be online and what's not accepted to be online. And freedom of expression is not uh is not total to everyone there's there's all these obstacles and and uh unfortunately also at the same time and also that was normal a lot of uh, states authoritarian regimes have also jumped on the on the technology game and they have a lot of more resources than uh what everyone does and they started hiring uh, um, other technologists to play the game and they start uh, manipulating the technology. And uh, uh, here we are in 2021, there's, there's this uh, struggle and, uh, and also the, the elephant in the room are the tech companies. So there's, there's different dynamics now. There's, 
uh, the authoritarian regimes, which they are very strong, but tech companies seems to be stronger as well. And there's all these activists, all these uh, different communities who are fighting for basic human rights or uh, just to be listened and to expect to achieve uh, living, uh, social justice, uh, basic democracy, I mean, many things. And unfortunately, in 2021, many of our friends are either in jail or have been uh, uh, in exile for many years. And uh, some of them have died as well. They, they paid the price. So this is, this is uh, the situation. Uh, we, back to the tech companies, uh, the debate, I mean, many look at it as uh, content moderation issues, uh, others want to challenge the business model. Um, also, there's there's a deep look into into the the laws in the U.S. Uh, and how the tech companies have all the freedoms they have to act the way they act. So there's some limitation they might need to happen to these companies. Uh, so we're here, and unfortunately now a lot of Gulf companies are investing a lot. Uh, and the new tools and technologies, um, they they put a lot of money in new apps. Uh, tech companies' offices are in the Gulf, uh, so the challenge is bigger. Uh, but we also still have hope because uh, we we have some opportunities. We 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 have we have some pressure points we need to keep doing. Uh, we need to be more organized. Uh, we need to talk to each other more. And uh, I'm hopeful about the coming years. Thank you, Mohammed. I think you've uh, uh, you've um, wrapped it quite nicely. We have been actually over the past decades in a state of negotiations between uh, yeah. between us as users and also those tech companies. And speaking of which, I uh, would like to show a video from our friend, uh, uh, imprisoned human rights defender, Ala Abdel Fattah, who uh, quite fittingly to the theme of, of our event, has uh, uh, was a, speak, a keynote speaker for the first rights con in 2011. So um, if we can show the video from Ala and what he said in regards to tech companies. I guess I'm here as an activist, as a foot soldier in the revolution to talk about how um, tech companies can find ways um, to maintain and promote and protect uh, and respect the human rights of their users. Now, that's a topic I'm quite cynical about. Companies are not really likely to do any of that. Corporations are not really likely to do any of that. It comes, <laughs> it, um, the conflict, with, you know, it's not exactly that there is a conflict of interest. I mean, it, I think we're all here because we know that it's actually possible to go about our business without infringing of people's rights and without allowing and being um, tools that are being used to infringe on people, people's rights. But the relationship, the structure of relationships between power is such that even if it's possible, even if it doesn't cost much, even if it's not going to affect the profit margins, it's probably not going to happen. But it also sometimes conflicts with the profit margin in very funny ways. So, you know, if you need, if from the perspective of an activist, some very normal features can be quite annoying, can be quite problematic. Real name policies, um, uh, rate limits on Twitter, real name policies on Facebook, or anything like that, that is actually uh, problematic. If you're trying to mobilize people the way mobile companies are trying to monetize every single transaction, that limits what we can do. But this is the business model, and you know, I don't expect neither Twitter nor Facebook nor the mobile companies to change their business models just for activists. So that is not going to happen. But here's something that could happen. You can, you know, Companies, if governments are trying to pass legislation or you know, change regulation and it's going to affect their profit, then companies do stand up, do make a noise, do try and change things. But if the same governments are doing something sinister that's going to affect humans, that's going to affect their users, they're not likely to talk about it. 
So we've all heard about the kill switch, how Egypt was completely cut off from the internet for um, a few days during the first uprising in the revolution. Vodafone and co, their defense, their constant defense is that this was by the law, there was nothing that they could do. But they knew about that law two years in advance. And they never made a noise. We in Egypt had ways of fighting unjust laws. We could take it to the Constitutional Court. We could do a campaign against it. The, it, it might have been possible for us to get rid of that law before the revolution happened if the companies had chosen to actually expose the fact that it happened to us. That law was almost secret. And that I think it's in quite incredible how he predicted, of course, I mean, and um, stated back in 2011 that tech companies are not doing what they're supposed to do. And unfortunately, that status quo has not changed. Mohammed, do you have any um, reactions or uh, comments in regards to what Ala had uh, mentioned back in 2011? Uh, I mean, I, I remember that trip because I was also there and I was just didn't know if it was 2011 or 2012, honestly. Uh, yeah, that was 2011. Uh, I mean, yes, he was totally right. We were also talking about these issues outside in the garden. It was sunny back then in San Francisco. Uh, I mean, I know Jillian was there, Catherine was there, Catherine Maher, also our friend. And I'm not sure if Dia was there as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he was very hopeful. And I, uh, I also remember he went to the protest. There was a protest back then somewhere near San Francisco. So he went there in the bus or something. Uh, I mean, yeah, he, he has a point. Uh, he, there's, there's a prediction. And unfortunately, we are here now. Um, we, we also want to wish Allah that we can see him again soon. Uh, so he'll be released. So free Allah. Indeed, uh, free Allah and all the political prisoners and activists who are uh, behind bars. Um, as we convene and speak today uh, in many of those oppressive uh, regimes, um, thank you so much, Muhammad, and we will hold on to that conversation and think, uh, discuss later what we can do to change the status quo. Uh, I will hand it over now to my colleague Dima, Dima Samaro. Um, over to you. Thanks, Marwa, and uh, thanks also, Muhammad, for your reflection. Uh, all right, uh, so just a quick intro. My name is Dima Samaro, and I'm the policy analyst for the Middle East and North Africa Access Now. Um, so for our next session, um, now we will uh, tackle the issue of ongoing um, and increased um, crackdown on human rights activists, journalists, and opponents in the Middle East and North Africa to shut down digital activism and political activism in the region as well. We have asked graduates and uh, journalists and activists from the MENA region uh, to provide their testimonies on their experience and uh, what has it changed for them in terms of digital activism. So since 2011, what has changed for digital activism and social and political activism in general, and even if they are still even affected by um, the repressive of the government in the region? Um, so we have two videos from two activists in the region. Uh, we will have a video from Libya at least, uh, and Libya is editor at BBC Media Action. She's a journalist and a storyteller about human rights um, in, in Libya. And she also served as, um, she covered um, different media and news during the revolution in 2011 in Libya and across the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and the second speaker, we will have also with us a video from Emna Muzuni. And Emna is a human rights activist and um, a, a human rights defender as well from Tunisia. Uh, she has also participated in these uh, political movements and she will also provide her testimony. Uh, so now we will have the videos um, and we can comment afterwards. Ten years ago, the night of 15th of February, I remember I was uh, checking the Facebook page called Sabatash Fabrayat Tawrat al Ghadab when the old regime forces broke into our house to arrest my father. Uh, and I remember the first thing I did before I even run to the door uh, to see what's happening was to send Facebook 
status and tweets to say they're breaking into our house, trying to uh, stop us, the revolution have started and so on. Um, today I look back and I'm like, I really don't believe that 17 years old me did that, even though it was really um, dangerous back then. I grew up uh, on, on stories about people that would lose their lives doing that. They broke into our house that day because of a similar action, because my dad went out to news channels to report on the first protest that took place uh, uh, in, in Benghazi. Um, but also, I believe I've done that because 17 years old me thought that uh, I'm not really heard online uh, and that uh, uh, I've never experienced using social media for any other purpose rather than to connect with family and friends based elsewhere in the world or to follow up with trends and, and so on. But since then, I've became the active uh, digital user that I am today uh, and I've been um, uh, using the, the, the digital space to practice my uh, civil activism. Um, uh, today, 10 years after, I am the editor for uh, social media platforms that promote social cohesion uh, and that, that, that are trying to create uh, safe platforms for young Libyans uh, to exchange experiences and to uh, speak up their views and to connect and to spot the light on uh, the richness of the Libyan uh, culture and to spot the light on the fact that um, none of us is benefiting from the conflict. Um, um, so in the past 10 years, uh, I have developed a lot of uh, knowledge and, and I've, I've developed great faith in digital activism. Um, another story that I would like to, to share with you today, to, spot the light, uh, to, to say that not all stories are, are positive and, um, and promising. Um, in, in 2014, I, I, I had a break uh, from several lives. Uh, I was going through uh, my personal battle. I was going through a depression due to the, the conflict and due to myself and my family um, um, having to flee, being forced to flee the country due to the civil conflict. Um, uh, so at that time, I, I disconnected. I, 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 I didn't follow news or reflection of news and I didn't want to know anything that's happening on the ground. Until that night in September 2014, when I got phone calls from people asking me to go online um, to see a piece of news that I need to learn about myself. And when I did so, um, it was the news that my dearest friend, the late Tawfiq bin Saud, assassination in Benghazi. And um, it was some sort of a, a, a call, a, a wake up call for me to figure out that disconnecting from from news is not going to stop news from happening and not practicing my activism is not going to uh, stop the 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 enemy of, uh, of building barriers it's it's just going to allow them to build more um i what libya lost uh our dear Tawfiq bin Saud due to his civil and political activism and digital activism and really digital activism back then and until today is about the tool that this generation mastered how to use. Um, as it is in real life, as it is online and on the internet, when, when, you, when you stop, it's going to be harder for you to expand and it's going to be easier for others to build more barriers and to limit you. So therefore, I know this generation is not going to stop their civil activism and the internet is going to continue to be the tool for us to connect, to, to open, widen our knowledge and our eyes on what 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 we're, what what this generation is going through no matter where we are no matter what we believe in our backgrounds 
it's easier for you to read and to watch and to learn about what's going on with others elsewhere to be able to accept them the way they are and to be able to learn from their experiences. Ten years after the Arab Spring, Tunisia is still facing the same issues. Or even, some people, they would say, more issues than before. The reality is, we are so unfortunate to be celebrating the 10th anniversary of our uprising in Tunisia by a huge and massive crackdown on the freedoms that we gained from that revolution. The freedom of protest. People they are arresting for the sake of protesting the social and economic protest or the political protest also. People they are arrested for their blog posts. And here blogging changed a lot in the last 10 years. Before the revolution, we were talking about people using blogs as uh, platforms. Now they're using social media platforms to express themselves. And so many people, they were arrested in Tunisia, unfortunately, based on their posts on social media, and specifically on Facebook. Facebook was a very important tool. It was not the reason of the revolution, as some people, they would pretend, but it was one of the tools that um, Tunisians used for their uprising. We used Facebook to rely the information of what was happening specifically in um, December 2010 and January 2010, uh, 2011. Sorry, That crucial period, um, a lot of information was used on Facebook and a lot of information and I, as I remember a lot of even profiles, they were censored from Facebook. Censorship was a thing, was very, very obvious by the Ben Ali regime now it's not censorship as much as it's threats on everybody's freedom of expression. Media was targeted at many points in the last 10 years. So it's if we continue saying that um, our assets, uh, we're a democracy, we're a successful democracy, I would say we're lying with ourselves because unfortunately there is a huge crackdown right now on the civic space. Um, we've seen a lot of... Um, counter protest and those counter protests also they are um, a big issue if people um, who are officers security officers protesting with their weapons this is a threat to the democracy and this is a threat to the right to protest peaceful protests are welcome and they should be welcomed by everybody um, as a, an activist from Tunisia and I'm seeing what's happening um, at some point I would feel like we're losing our revolution, we're losing the assets of this revolution. But at the same time, um, I would say, let's keep the hope in ourselves. Let's keep thinking that what's happening right now is not, um, is a test for this democracy, is a test for the Tunisian people. This crisis should get us stronger. I think the new generation um, that is taking over the streets um, by protesting and continuing to protest um, has showed a massive change in the way of protesting. Their way of activism online and offline is different. It's very different because they learned how to protest while they have the freedom of protest and freedom of expression and freedom of internet as well. Information is available. We have the access inform of information as an asset from um, this uprising. And so those little tools um, are the tools that we're doing. Um, it's very important now that many bodies and many activists would um, hang in and try to understand how to navigate the situation and to move forward. Um, after 10 years, things are changing, things, things changed drastically in many ways, and so I think it's very important that we understand activism has changed, the access or the assets um, of the revolution are tools to continue forward and not to just um, take them for granted because as we are seeing, civic space um, is not taken for granted, freedoms in Tunisia are not taken for granted or should not really be taken for granted and the revolution is still ongoing, absolutely. Okay, um, I would like to thank uh, our speakers, uh, Emna and Livia, uh, for the amazing testimony that they have given 
um, to, to be able to understand also um, what the future of this whole assembly is, uh, if the crackdown is going to continue or take place in our region. Um, so there, like, um, there was uh, amazing um, testimonies, and again, thank you so much. Uh, okay, so now we are heading to our next session, which is also very relevant to the testimonies that discuss or uh, shed light on. And it's mainly related to uh, content moderation policies and different actors also involved and in, uh, of the crackdown that is taking place in the region. And uh, for this session, uh, mainly we will um, highlight the issue of um, uh, censorship by uh, social media platforms and how they even play the role in, um, in the repression as well, uh, along governments in the region. Um, so we're going to explore more uh, to understand the policies and how there are some biased content moderation policies of social media platforms and uh, as well as um, unfair and discrimination in some of their community standards or terms of service, for example. Um, and as a result, many activists um, and key activists have been silenced and their voices, uh, they couldn't basically raise up their voice or speak up on social media um, because of these uh, bias policies. Um, so now we will have in this uh, session, I'll have uh, with me uh, Dia Kayali and uh, uh, so we will be having a discussion about this. It will, be, it will be like a fireside chat, so we can ask questions and just uh, speak together about this issue and understand more from Dia about also her point of view. Uh, so Dia is uh, Associate Director for Advocacy uh, at uh, Menominic, uh, the umbrella organization for Syria Archive, Yemeni Archive, and Sudanese Archive. In their role, uh, DIA focuses on the real-life impact of policy decisions made by lawmakers and technology companies about content moderation and related topics. Uh, previously, DIA served as a program manager for Tech Advocacy at Witness, and uh, they got uh, their start in the digital rights as an activist at the Electronic uh, Frontier Foundation. Uh, so I'm really glad to have you here with us, uh, DIA, and thank you so much for joining uh, the discussion. Um, Okay, so we can start uh, by asking a question uh, about, about content moderation policies and also how do you see this um, has been shaped in the region? Uh, what do you see the role of Facebook, for example, and Twitter, YouTube, and different platforms, how they, to some extent, have also uh, been part of the repression and silencing a human rights defenders and activists in the MENA region? Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me. Um, and I have to say, I'm, I'm just really honored to be a part of this discussion. Uh, you know, on, on my end, I was in the US in 2010 and 2011. And at the same time as, you know, we were seeing all of this happening on social media, um, it was also happening in the US. I think it's an interesting reminder that, um, you know, the Oscar Grant protests were happening in Oakland. And, and I think there was just a lot of excitement around the world about social media and people were, were looking at what was happening and they were saying, wow, like people can use Facebook to tell their story outside of their country um, and to organize. Uh, unfortunately, you know, and I, I'm so glad that we saw that clip from Allah. Um, you know, he, he was pretty psychic. Um, exactly what he predicted is what we've seen, that it's really not in the business model of these companies to ensure free expression in our region um, and in fact unfortunately we've seen that a lot of the times when they use new tools or they have new policies they want to you know test trying to get a certain type of content off very quickly by using um, ai or something like that they do it in our region so 10 years later um, and especially you know as you mentioned i i, I work with mnemonic and um, you know, we've seen just a huge quantity of content deleted. And for a lot of us, it feels like our, our history is getting erased. So um, there's still a lot of process. And, uh, you know, we also had a ray of hope from Mohammed saying there, there, we do still have hope. Um, but I think there's been a lot of cold awakenings uh, around really how these policies work and how important we are to these companies, um, you know, and how important our voices are. And, and, and the content coming from our region. And oftentimes it kind of seems like 
we're really the last thing on their minds when they're making their policies or, or creating new tools for content moderation. Yes, uh, thank you, Dia. So I think you touch on an important point um, also that is relevant to the events that we are having today because also activists, as we mentioned, use these platforms to organize and mobilize. Uh, so they were seeking these platforms as, you know, like a, a, an opportunity uh, to, to, to participate, to organize themselves, to be more active. So, um, of course, th this tool has a played like, um, has, has a played a huge role in shaping uh, the internet and shaping the online space. But can you um, mention, based on your expertise, uh, like uh, what sort of bias policies, where do you think, or like a, if you can give examples on where do you think there are bias policies of these uh, social media platforms? Uh, so for example, we can mention uh, takedown of content um, or um, uh, unequal enforcement of uh, terms of service or community standards of uh, tech platforms. So what do you think uh, from your experience, what do you think are like some uh, key examples or hot topics related to this um, that has put published in, in the region? Yeah, so I, I want to mention a few things. So um, I, it's the policies, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. It's the tools. But third, and this is very important, it's also, as I said, how we fit into the business model and how important our rights are compared to kind of the rest of the world. Um, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, how much are companies willing to fight for users to, to challenge government requests for data um, as opposed to potentially other places. So let me explain a little bit of what I mean. So I'll start by the, the policies themselves. Um, so one of the areas, uh, and, and this is of course not in any way comprehensive, but just especially because of what I focus on, one of the areas where we see a huge amount of bias is the removal of so-called um, graphic content or so-called terrorist and violent extremist content. Um, so we see a lot of takedowns in our region j just simply because the policies themselves are based on biased information. So um, for example, Facebook has a dangerous organizations list. That list is not public, but we know that that list is greatly influenced by two things. One is U.S. designations of forest, foreign terrorist organizations, and the other is the U.N. sanctions list. And these lists are almost exclusively groups that are, um, that are either coming from Arabic-speaking or Muslim-majority countries. Uh, and they, are, they have, for example, very few far-right or white supremacist groups. So even though companies talk in this neutral language of terrorist and violent extremist content, um, what it ultimately comes down to is it's a, a lot of content, um, including counter speech. So this is one of the things that we see, you know, when people speak out against, for example, Hezbollah or, or, or even Hamas, that content gets taken down in the same way as content that might actually be coming from those groups. Um, so the policies themselves, the organizations that are on the list, um, also the way that the policies are rolled out, uh, policies um, and, and the new tools as well. So I mentioned artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms. So these tools are being trained on biased data. They're being trained on data that is being collected by people who are sitting in Menlo Park. They're not really clear on what the, what the political situation is. Um, the, the tools themselves have a very hard time taking into context. Um, so for example, something we just saw, um, we've seen content get, get taken down from protests in Lebanon but again, was actually critical of, of Hezbollah, for example, but because maybe it had just the word in there, um, it got it gets taken down by the automated moderation. And also the automated moderation itself and natural language processing, it does very poorly with Arabic. Um, we've all seen how ridiculously sometimes Google Translate can translate things from, from Arabic to English. Uh, now imagine those kind of problems but every day sifting through all the content from our region, all of this content that might be on the line of the policies, you know, it's, it's graphic, but it, um, because it's showing human rights violations, but it actually falls under a newsworthy exception or a human rights exception. But then you have this, um, this automated content moderation that really is just not equipped to understand that very delicate context. Um, so the other thing I also wanna mention is just, you know, how much are companies willing to fight for users, um, 
how much are they willing, for example, to, to push back on bad policies? We are seeing more and more indications that actually companies are just going to do whatever it is that governments ask them to do. And of course, we have a very bad example of companies' relationships with, um, for example, with the, you know, the Israeli government. Um, but also, uh, this isn't our region, but it's very close. You know, we just saw um, that companies agreed to comply with this Turkish um, law now that requires them to have someone in the country in order to, to continue functioning. You know, what other governments are they going to comply with? And at what point are they going to say, no, we're not going to hand over that data. No, we're not going to institute this policy. Um, so, you know, it's the automation. It's how much companies are actually willing to engage with us, engage with civil society, um, particularly when civil society doesn't agree with government. Um, and it's the way the policies are written themselves. They're just really not written to make these platforms, you know, great tools for activists. They are, as Allah said, they're really um, made to make money ultimately. So, you know, that's really quite a bit at the heart of the problem. Yes, uh, thank you so much, so much, Dia. I think um, these are great answers. Um, so basically, could we say that they, like uh, platforms have failed to develop content, context based like on the MENA region that also, that is reflected or like, uh, you know, because some of the context is more like a global, but it couldn't fit sometimes when we talk about the MENA region, that couldn't be the case, you know. Um, we have seen, for example, and you mentioned something about uh, documenting violations. Um, we are speaking, for example, about war crimes in Syria. And, um, and also when they took many uh, videos down because they, so uh, this obviously has a, a long-term also impact on um, documentation and reporting on human rights violations. Um, so do you think also because usually they lack providing like transparency about their policies and even when they take some content down, they don't like uh, sometimes in some cases that we have received even in access now, we don't receive like a clear uh, um, uh, explanation or a clarification on why that content has been taken down. Um, so do you think this also, you know, is part of the repression and how they also are silencing activists and dissenters specifically and opponents in the region? Um, absolutely. Just to give you a, a sense of what this looks like. For example, the last time that we ran a check on our collection of content from Syria, um, we found that at least 23% of the content that we have found, verified, and archived off of the platform, um, this is YouTube, at least 23% of that content is no longer available. Sometimes it's no longer available because somebody made the video private, but a lot of times it's because it got taken down. And I can tell you, and I'm, I'm sure that um, anybody who's you know run a hotline or, or who talks to activists on a regular basis, people oftentimes get notifications and they, they have no idea what the notification means because of the way that it's written, or they just have no idea why their account gets taken down. You know, they, they reach out to us and, and, and um, they say, yeah, suddenly my account was suspended. Um, the, the notifications, and it depends on the company. Some give better information than others. Um, but a lot of times it's just, you, you violated our policies and you can no longer post. And unfortunately, sometimes this happens in the middle of some big event. Um, so we've seen uh, a lot of times that there's a big surge. We saw a ton of accounts um, get shut down in Sudan when there was sit-ins happening there. Um, we saw, as I mentioned, a lot of accounts get shut down just recently in, in Beirut. Um, you know, it, and the companies oftentimes don't have enough staffing to very rapidly respond then when we say, you know, this is, this is an issue, these, these um, accounts need to be available now because they're giving really important information. Um, and, you know, I know that we're not the only ones who've been tracking that kind of removal. Um, Amle has done a lot of work just showing how massive amounts of, of content that's documenting human rights violations there is getting taken down as well. Yeah, thanks uh, so much, Dia. Uh, yeah, so I think, um, well, basically, I think these platforms uh, sometimes benefit or profit of from human rights violations. We also saw that, for example, with the uh, uh, advertised ads, for example, on, um, I would say, like uh, during the elections in 2019 in Tunisia, 
um, there was also like a lack of transparency about um, the um, the democratic transition in Tunisia in general. So I would say this is also, you know, like uh, also could apply to other countries in the region because we are talking about, you know, how we can democratize our countries uh, or like at least transparent when it comes to these uh, policies and how they are. Um, so what do you think, like, what would be part of the solution in your point of view? I know that you mentioned that engaging with civil society, having a discussion uh, could be effective. Um, I know that we also like uh, we have engaged different times with these platforms, but I don't feel like a, a you know like a sufficient uh, solution by the end of the day, or I, I don't see many actions you know like are implemented after these discussions and meetings. So, what do you think could be like the solution to give activists and human rights defenders still that space and be part of the change, like uh, as we talk about Arab Spring now? Uh, but of course, how we can also have a concrete actions from these companies instead of saying that we will uh, try our best, this is what we will do, but again, you don't have like a concrete actions by the end of the day or eventually. So what do you think in your point of view could be part of the solution um, to give activists this space again to be able to speak up? Yeah, so I think that the, this feeling of, uh, you know, something really big happens and then we all sort of do a public letter or, um, you know, we, we push on the companies, they, they respond and say, okay, we see that that's a problem and then nothing ever happens. This is very common for people who work on content moderation and free expression and it, it is incredibly frustrating. Um, so one of the things is uh, that companies do need to engage with civil society and they have increased their amount of engagement but it needs to not just be pr so um you know companies need to actually engage with civil society in co-design of new policies and tools and what i mean by that is for example um you know there's a a, a huge global push to get rid of um as i mentioned you know so-called i say so-called terrorist violent and extremist content because there is no actually agreed upon definition, but there is a huge push around this globally, right? Um, so if companies do want to, for example, use natural language processing, or they do want to use um, machine learning algorithms to try to detect and take down content, then they need to sit down with us and talk to us about, here's the, um, here's the training data that I'm using for this algorithm. Um, here's some of the, the uh, you know, out outputs that I get from this training data when I, when I feed it into the machine learning algorithm. Um, so actually at the very ground level, sitting down with civil society and designing tools and policies together instead of once they're already designed and we have these huge problems when they kind of get released into the platform ecosystem. And then, you know, we're all struggling to try to address it after the fact. So um, actually engaging at the ground level with civil society um, in the way that they're functioning being much clearer about their relationships with governments. Um, you know, I think increasingly these companies have so much power over our lives that they should be clear about, you know, this is when we talk to a government, this is when we comply with a government. And of course, they're doing transparency reports that talk about legal requests, but that's not enough. Um, all of their transparency reports need to have more, uh, more granular information, so much more specific information. And also, when they give notices to users, those notices need to actually explain why content was taken down. Um, what was the policy under which the content was taken down? And how can you appeal it? Um, so, you know, making sure that people are clear on their, on their rights of appeal. Um, and also just having enough staff in our, um, in our regions. They, they've struggled, you know, I know um, at least one company has really struggled to maintain staff uh, to, to talk to civil society. So making sure that they are hiring enough people, um, that they are also taking into account the, the biases of their own employees as well. Uh, a lot of times we've heard, for example, like LGBTQ related content gets taken down a lot and people feel like that might be because of the, the content moderators or the employees themselves. So just looking at, at things like that. Um, and, you know, all of these things ultimately are aimed at pulling the company as much as possible from their profit motive uh, of just making money, um, which is this is why it's so hard for us, you know, to actually being accountable to the people who are using the platform and to human rights. And, and I think that's really at the heart of our work is, is 
pulling them towards that. And sometimes we're seeing success. Uh, a lot of times it's just, it's quite frustrating. So um, I also want to echo what Mohammed said earlier of it's really important as much as possible for us to be talking to each other and not just talking to each other in our region, but also having ties with people in other places. You know, I've seen some really interesting examples of um, groups from Beirut talking to groups from Chile, or, uh, you know, there's a lot happening with social media platforms in India right now um, and how activists are getting kicked off there. Um, what does it look like for us, for example, to be uh, forming solidarity with farmers uh, in the farmers protests in India, um, or with all of these other movements and activists around the world? So um, I know you're asking what the companies should do, but also what we have the, our own power to do is also to be doing more of this cross-border solidarity with each other and um, making sure that they can't ignore us because it's really easy for them to ignore voices that are outside of the US and Europe and in particular, Western Europe. Um, so we can raise our voices together. And I think we are seeing more of that. And that's something that gives me hope. Thank you so much, Priya. That's a really powerful statement. And uh, thank you again for joining uh, this discussion. Um, thanks for sharing your insights and for your re reflection. Um, so now we will move to the next session. Um, so I'll hand it over to my colleague, Marwa. Uh, Thanks, Dima, and thanks, Dia, again, for uh, all the work you do. And uh, I know for those of us who work on content moderation issues, sometimes it feels like Sisyphus work. Um, but we need to continue doing what we're doing. Uh, now, moving on to the issue of surveillance. Um, it is no secret that many Arab governments have invested millions of dollars uh, to acquire uh, the latest uh, digital surveillance technologies to spy on their citizens, to target human rights defenders, um, and also to commit human rights uh, violations. Probably in this discussion, uh, the most, uh, the, the first example that comes to mind uh, is the, the brutal murder of uh, the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi and the role uh, the Israeli company uh, NSO uh, group has played into uh, facilitating um, that, that crime through spying on his colleagues uh, up to the point of his uh, murder. Another example is uh, the case of the Emirati human rights defender Ahmad Mansour, who's serving a 10 year uh, prison sentence, also spied on by the government using um, the infamous NSO uh, Pegasus uh, spyware. And so we've we've uh, been documenting many examples and cases of activists who have been the target of such malicious uh, surveillance campaigns, um, together with other organizations such, such as uh, Citizen Lab uh, and many uh, others in our space. Um, so we will talk today. Um, first, I would love to uh, start with Fouad Abdel Momani, a human rights activist joining us from Morocco and also uh, a great ex-colleague of mine. Uh, thank you so much, Fouad, for joining us. Um, you've, been, you've recently um, uh, shared with us your courageous testimony, being the target of um, of uh, uh, surveillance, um, especially in the case of uh, basically the NSO hacking into WhatsApp. Uh, there have been at least 1,400 um, users, um, activists, lawyers, journalists who were the target of um, this exploitation. So could you share with us your experience uh, being uh, the target of, of, of this campaign and um, and, and what that means for your work as a human rights activist. Uh, over to you, Fouad. Uh, Helen, thank you very much for uh, having me with you in this session uh, and for all the work you are doing. Uh, I, uh, uh, I was informed by the Citizen Lab on, of uh, 2019 that uh, my uh, phone had been targeted with uh, this uh, spyware and uh, uh, it simply uh, uh, confirmed that uh, I was targeted through different means uh, in my intimacy 
by uh, services that uh, wanted to have anything about not any dangerous uh, armed uh, violent action but on my uh, civil society activities as a promoter of uh, human rights and transparency. And uh, at that time, we uh, agreed, uh, we were eight persons who agreed to uh, go public on this intrusion in our intimacy and uh, uh, violation of uh, our uh, rights. There was no official reaction by the state of Morocco, but uh, we had different uh, uh, exacerbations of the, the action of the state and its different apparatus against, different, uh, against us. And uh, one of the main uh, promoters of uh, this uh, uh, campaign of uh, publicity about the spyware, Marte uh, Munjib, was uh, afterward uh, uh, attacked on different kinds of uh, accusations that were not uh, directly political. Uh, he was accused of, uh, uh, of ha having, uh, receiving uh, money from abroad, uh, uh, laundering money, things like that, while it was simply for the civil, uh, his civil uh, activities. And uh, then he was uh, uh, incarcerated. And uh, on another trial, he was condemned for two one year uh, prison. And uh, other uh, of uh, his companions uh, were also condemned to jail. Uh, for myself, I. Uh, uh, I saw uh, tens of people receiving uh, uh, videos uh, on myself and uh, my partner uh, having sex in our uh, home. So uh, it meant that they didn't have only uh, the spyware on the phone and probably on the uh, all other uh, computer or uh, technical means, but also they had cameras, uh, very sophisticated ones, uh, inside different parts of uh, our homes, and they had no uh, fear, no uh, complex giving these elements to the public. So uh, the of course, we can understand that spyware could be used because you have sometimes, against some situations, uh, the risks of uh, uh, for the life and uh, the uh, civil security. But uh, the problem in our countries is that uh, it's not used mainly against uh, any uh, terrorist risk, but it's basically against civil society, uh, Pacific activists who simply are uh, promoting the basic rules of, uh, 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 of uh, good governance, of freedom, uh, and uh, uh, stopping impunity of uh, our rulers. Uh, now, uh, we see that uh, in different situations, the, uh, the rulers are getting uh, harsher, are uh, getting ruthless uh, with this kind of means. But still, I think we, we have to remain confident uh, to maintain our faith that uh, we are still uh, on a good path because uh, I can testify when I, uh, I was a young man uh, in the 70s and 80s of the last century, we could never enjoy or think of this kind of discussions we are having now and all the strength it can give and strength that uh, 
uh, uh, don't allow our rulers to uh, to go to the tools they used to uh, uh, to use against uh, any opponent. I mean, uh, disappearance, uh, uh, incommunicado, detention for years, things that I uh, I had to leave myself uh, when I was uh, uh, in my uh, teenage and my 20s. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Fouad. First of all, for sharing with us your uh, lived experience. Um, it, I can only imagine, you know, how hard it must be or for you. Um, I also wanted to follow up quickly um, because this is not the first case that we hear of uh, for, of the Moroccan authorities using sophisticated uh, spyware to spy on uh, Moroccan activists. The last case we've heard of is the, um, the targeting of uh, the journalist Omar Radi, who's also facing uh, bogus charges related to uh, uh, sexual assault, uh, among other charges. So how are Moroccan civil society organizations fighting against this, uh, um, this surveillance that obviously is taking place with a, in an environment of impunity? Uh, I would say that uh, uh, we don't feel that we, uh, we are in a state of law where you could have this kind of uh, uh, illegitimate uh, behavior by state apparatus uh, uh, investigated and condemned. So basically, nobody is going to uh, the justice apparatus to ask for any questioning of this kind of uh, behaviors. I would say that the main thing is uh, to get it on the public scene uh, in a clear way, in a strong way, in a collective way, in a way that is shared by all uh, serious actors of civil society. And uh, I think that this uh, is making the political cost of this uh, uh, rogue state behavior uh, getting worse and hopefully uh, come to a moment to uh, stop it or at least uh, make it uh, become again marginal and not uh, mainstream. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, indeed. Um, I think one of the reasons why this uh, problem continues to happen is the international ecosystem, uh, so to speak, in which uh, private companies and governments to continue to operate and uh, trade these surveillance technologies without a shred of transparency or accountability. And we'll speak to the, uh, on this issue in a bit with uh, Natalia. Uh, but for now, um, I'm looking at you, Maria, Maria al uh, a dear friend and also a prominent uh, Bahraini uh, human rights defender. Um, so we, yeah, I think Najim had kind of alluded to uh, the Gulf countries, one of the wealthiest in our region, um, and how they've used spyware um, to not only spy on citizens who live in those countries, but also those who managed to escape uh, the oppression and live in, uh, live in exile. And now we're hearing more reports about the UAE and, and other countries trying to, to develop their own homegrown surveillance technologies. Um, so they are ambitious in, in their uh, pursuit. So can you speak to us about your personal experience as well as um, ex experiences from, from the Gulf region, from Bahrain, of course, and from the Gulf uh, region? Thank you, Marwa, and uh, thank you for having me here. I appreciate it. And for organizing this amazing panel. Um, it's been really interesting listening to all of my colleagues speak on these issues. Um, Yes, I think, you know, it's it's only natural that when talking about surveillance technology and human rights that the Gulf is going to come up over and over again, uh, given the kind of resources that they have and their ability in, in uh, both purchasing, but also making sure that there is a lack of accountability around the use of spyware uh, and spyware technology, um, not pretty much in the region. Um, I think, you know, for me personally, I've been the target of, of potential of um, of uh, attempts 
to take over my email, to hack my devices and so on. Thankfully, uh, we've had some uh, great colleagues like Bill Marzak at Citizen Lab, like Mohamed Masqati at Frontline Defenders and others who have really made a huge effort uh, in making sure that we're aware of how to protect ourselves online and, and looking for the red flags when that sort of thing does happen. Um, and so even though there were attempts where we actually were able to verify that the attachment that was sent to me did actually uh, have spyware in it and had I downloaded it and opened it, opened it, it would have downloaded the spyware into my device. But because I knew to look for the red flag, um, what I was able to avoid that. That being said, I think, especially now with the normalization deal um, that the Gulf has entered ent into, we're looking at a situation where things are going to become and have become more difficult for Gulf activists, because we're looking at a situation where the exchange of spyware and surveillance technology is going to happen even in, a, in an even more smooth uh, transaction. Um, and this is something that I think for most of civil society in the Gulf, as soon as we heard as, about the normalization deals, that was one of the first alarms to go off for us, is that we already knew that NSO was being used against us. We already knew that surveillance technology beyond NSO as well was being used by our regimes um, in targeting us. And now with the normalization deals, we can only expect it to get worse, um, especially looking at the kind of uh, surveillance and technology that's being used against Pal uh, Palestinian activists and Palestinian civil society society um, in the same frame. Um, beyond that, I think, you know, when you talk about um, the, the occupation and how they use surveillance technology against Palestinians, the way when you talk about the Gulf states and how they use surveillance technology, that doesn't necessarily come as a surprise. That's something that's more expected. We know these are oppressive governments. We know these are governments that break, you know, violate human rights and, and regularly get away with it. I think Part of the conversation that really needs to be shifted and focused on is the double standards within places like the EU, the European Union, um, and the lack of real accountability and regulation around the sale, the selling of spyware technology and surveillance technology to oppressive governments from the EU, from EU-based companies. I'll give you a very quick example. Um, we found out that uh, the Danish government had approved of a sale of mass surveillance technology to Saudi Arabia that even the British had denied. Uh, the Danes then went ahead and approved it. And this mass surveillance technology was, was sold to Saudi Arabia. We don't know if it's been used beyond the Saudi borders, because as we know in the GCC, the security agreement between the different countries means if one country receives a tool, it's very likely the rest of the countries receive it and use it as well. Um, and so what we know about the mass surveillance technology that was approved for sale by the Danish government, you know, a government that presents itself as very much on the forefront of human rights, uh, fighting for especially when it comes to gender equality and so on. This mass surveillance technology may have actually been used in the targeting of the women human rights defenders who were imprisoned and tortured, like Lujain Hatlu, like others. It may have also, if it was shared with the Bahrainis, it may have also been used in the targeting of myself, my sister, and my father, who are Danish citizens. Um, and so you can see like the, the link in how uh, the, these double standards actually create this you know, series of violations that don't stop in, in, in one place, but they actually have a ripple effect in different areas as well. And so I think that's, that's a very, that's one of the examples of where, you know, there are these double standards where governments say, you know, we care about, for example, gender equality and women's rights, but then when it comes to the women, the rights of women in Saudi Arabia, maybe not so much, you know. And then the other example is um, the surveillance that's been done under COVID. You know, we're, we're seeing the, the bracelets and, and other things and apps that have been developed where as a citizen of that country, again, mass surveillance, where as a citizen of that country to access, um, you know, the services that you need, you can't live without it, you have to access those services, you are permitting and you are actually downloading the very app that is going to be used to, to um, survey you. And so we're, we're in these positions where even situations like a global pandemic is being used as a prime opportunity to do mass surveillance against these populations. Thank you, Mariam. And, and I think it is very important to highlight what you already mentioned that oppression in our region has become transnational. Over the, of the, over the years. It's no longer about the UAE surveilling its own citizens, but also surveilling those activists that are that live in Egypt or live in, in Syria and, and other places, and not only the UAE, but it's uh, shared and the new geopolitics of the region also reinforce that of, 
uh, that alliance of human rights abusers is coming together. Um, I guess the last uh, point we want to address here in this conversation regarding surveillance is how can we um, bring this problem to an end by exposing companies that are that operate pretty much in the dark and also um, those surveillance uh, technologies that come from the EU or from the US or Canada and being imported to um, sorry exported to uh, dictatorships in in different parts of the world, not only the MENA region. So I am turning to my uh, colleague Natalia uh, Krapiva, who is our uh, legal tech counsel, um, to share our bit on the work we and other uh, people or organizations in the space doing on this from, uh, from the legal and the regulation uh, front. Thank you, Mara, and thanks so much for all the speakers. And uh, Maria, I'm also highlighting the issue of EU export controls, which I'm gonna touch upon. So um, yeah, I would like to focus on the attempts to stop proliferation of these spyware technologies through across the uh, MENA region and beyond, uh, focusing in particular on export control regulations and litigation. So for the EU export control regime, if you know, back in 2011, the EU uh, decided to officially review their uh, rules for so so-called dual use surveillance items, dual use being uh, software technology or other goods that are uh, meant for both civilian and military purposes. Um, so that review was in fact driven in part by the Arab Spring and the human rights violations that were uncovered during um, that event and also the revelations of um, European technologies being sold and, and to the Arab dictators and um, that contributed to the abuses um, that happened and so and then also throughout the years, as the negotiators were sort of discussing these rules, there were also a number of surveillance abuses that have been revealed, uh, which have already been mentioned, like um, um, targeting of uh, Bahraini activists uh, that was done by uh, FinFisher or Gamma International, which is a UK and, and German uh, company. Um, there was also NSO group targeting of Ahmed Mansour, the killing of Jamal Khashoggi and um, the, the famous WhatsApp uh, hacking scandal, which uh, also uh, Fuad uh, spoke about and unfortunately been a victim of. Um, so, so the EU uh, proposed like early drafts of this um, recast of the, the existing rules. And they were very positive in the beginning. And we, Access Now and other civil society organizations, we who were working uh, on this, we were very happy about those rules. They included a lot of provisions that we asked for in order to ensure human rights protections. Um, but um, the process got stuck, unfortunately, over many years because of some of the EU member states were actually, as it was revealed, they were caring more about um, uh, profit than human rights and we're listening more to the companies than the civil society. So for example, uh, UK, Sweden and Finland, uh, there was leaked documents that revealed that they were very critical of this efforts and that they were just pushing for weaker human rights protections. And so that of course had an effect on the uh, resulting compromise draft that we saw in 2020 that was agreed upon. Uh, it was a really a far cry of, from what we as civil society asked for. Uh, for example, uh, the, 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 the final draft doesn't have the, um, the appropriate human rights standards that we wanted to be included. Uh, there's no mandatory human rights impact assessment. Um, the mechanism for emergency break provisions is uh, only partial, it's, it's inadequate. Um, there's other things like standalone EU control lists that would allow EU institutions and not companies to decide which technologies to include on this list. Uh, so that wasn't met. And there was some transparency provisions that were included, but they were again only partial and still allowed a, a leeway to companies to not disclose uh, data that's uh, required. And so even though we do welcome the, the, the several uh, positive provisions that were included, but overall, it's just been a disappointment that after uh, 10 years after the Arab Spring and so many egregious violations uh, facilitated by these technologies in the MENA region and beyond, 
EU member states are just unwilling to stick to their um, original commitments of protecting human rights and limiting the sales of these technologies. Um, so, so, but however, I just want to highlight it's not EU is not the only example. Of course, there's also efforts in US and Canada currently, and it uh, looks like there might be more room there to, to get more sort of in terms of human rights protections. And with the new Biden administration, hopefully we'll see where, uh, you know, they will listen to the civil society voices more. Um, so that's on the regulation side. And then on the litigation, um, so there's been also a number of efforts. Uh, the 2019, uh, there was a file, criminal complaint filed against the Finfisher uh, company that was revealed they were spying on activists in Turkey. Um, so, so I mean that 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 company's technologies was were used to spy on activists in Turkey. So that's there is some criminal investigation happening in Germany. Um, and then NSO, of course, faced multiple uh, lawsuits uh, around the world, uh, starting from 2018. There are multiple lawsuits uh, in Israel, Cyprus. Um, Amar Ab Abdulaziz filed a case in Israel against NSO. Um, there's also Amnesty International try to, uh, they led a campaign to revoke NSO's uh, expert license in Israel. Unfortunately, that was not successful. Um, and then there were a number of cases that are still, still being brought against the governments that use that technology to, to target um, activists and journalists, such as, for example, Yajamal Hashoji's fiance filed a case in the US. Um, and, but I wanted to highlight briefly the, uh, another recent case, which is interesting because it's filed by another uh, tech company, uh, which is WhatsApp and, and Facebook against uh, NSO group. So in California, um, we saw a case filed uh, by, by WhatsApp against NSO for targeting their servers actually in California to deliver the Pegasus spyware to the devices of the victims. Uh, we know it's over a thousand customers overall and about and more than hundred uh, civil society members that were targeted. And so that case is currently um, in the uh, on the ap appeal at the Ninth Circuit, um, the appealing jurisdiction. So basically, NSO is arguing that they should just evade all accountability because they were following government um, government uh, orders that the governments targeted the, the, the individuals and not NSO group. Um, and so we are challenging them on that. And Access Now and uh, other organizations uh, intervened uh, with Amicus Brief. Um, highlighting the stories of the victims of this NSO hack uh, and uh, from it's from India, Rwanda, Togo and Morocco and Fuad who spoke earlier he is one of those brave individuals who shared his experiences with us and the court and we included his testimonial in our brief so we do hope that the court will consider that um, that impact on, on the on the, that it had on the victims of the of the hacking um, and so, yeah, so just to sum up, uh, so there's been, uh, the progress has been very slow, both on regulation side and the litigation side, but I think we should, um, as civil society, we should keep fighting and highlighting the voices of victims uh, of these abuses and uh, insist on accountability and eventually putting an end to these abuses. Thank you so much, uh, Natalia. I'm conscious of time, so I will invite all of our panelists to join us now for um, the final discussion of today. We've received a couple of um, questions from our audience, so um, we can, um, let me see uh, the questions that we have, um, and then we can uh, jump into concluding remarks if you guys would like to um, uh, share final thoughts uh, with us. Um, so I guess maybe I'll start with you, Natalia, um, given that you're the lawyer in the room. So are there examples of strategic litigation that has succeeded to pressure tech companies into better behavior as um, it relates to the MENA region? I can't think of uh, examples in the MENA region, but there are examples in other countries, like with internet shutdowns, for example, we saw some companies being sued, for example, for facilitating shutdowns and uh, that being successful and uh, like shutdowns ending and then 
um, uh, and then uh, companies also revealing the information, the necessary evidence uh, that shows like sort of who ordered the shutdowns and what happened. So we saw some of those examples in the Africa region um, and in, um, in the Southeast Asia. So, um, so there is some hope, I think, uh, you know, and that's why these efforts are important. It can be very discouraging because the process is very slow. Uh, it happens over the years, but I think we should keep pressuring from multiple sides, from both like the litigation, regulation, and also like overall advocacy um, to make it, uh, you know, to push companies to, to change their behavior. And not only, again, the companies that are sort of the violators, but also other companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, who also have their infrastructure targeted and the users targeted with this spyware technology. So they, they could be also our allies and as we saw in WhatsApp case, and we should also hold them sort of accountable and say, okay, what are you doing about uh, your users being targeted in such a way? And how can you stand with the civil society to fight against this? Yeah, thank you, Natalia. And if I give one minute to all of our speakers, because we mentioned in the beginning of the conversation that we don't want to just cry over what's happening in our region because the issues are complex and tragic. Uh, but to actually, you know, um, think forward and think of ways we can still fight back and fight against uh, the different forms of oppression, whether it be coming from governments or from private tech companies. And so maybe I will start with, um, I'll start with Fuad. So if you can just share with us one uh, final reflection or thought uh, from you uh, on how we can move forward in this space, and then we'll move to the other speakers. Uh, my uh, impression is that uh, uh, the in our countries it's very difficult to uh, uh, to be alone facing the uh, uh, rock states we have. So uh, I think that uh, it's very important that uh, uh, we encourage as many people as possible to uh, get uh, public on these uh, situations and in the meantime have the uh, most uh, publicity and uh, uh, international involvement uh, uh, about the these situations and uh, uh, the the risk is that if we go uh, homeopathic it's easy to uh, just uh, let it uh, uh, get down or uh, even uh, be very harsh against uh, the people who are uh, denouncing the situations so i think we uh, we have today an opportunity to uh, uh, to go with uh, so many cases of people uh, in so many different places and to uh, uh, to impose uh, global reference about uh, uh, the uh, right uh, to intimacy and uh, uh, stopping impunity of uh, these behaviors, but it, uh, it calls for a real strong international coalition uh, and uh, being quite bold on, uh, uh, on these elements. Thank you. Excuse me, I didn't hear you. Uh... Marwa, did you speak? Oh, I'm on mute. I made that mistake. <laughs> okay, so thank you. And then I said, Dia. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I guess I'll just, uh, sorry to, to sort of repeat what I said earlier, but, uh, but I think that um, also, uh, as Fuad said, really want to second that I think there's a big opportunity in people, particularly people, um, outside of the EU and the US coming together 
to to share our voices and and share our advocacy and 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 make our voices heard. Um, you know, people in uh, South America, people in Southeast Asia, people in South Asia, they understand much better what our needs are. Um, and also some of the things that we've gone through. Uh, our, our governments are using the same tools and tactics against us. Um, legislation around misinformation around, and around regulating the internet. Um, also the tactics of how they target activists. Um, they're all very similar. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity right now. Well, we still have the internet, we still have access to it. Um, and that's one thing that really can't be taken away, you know, building relationships with each other um, uh, and, and seeing what others are going through. That's something that no amount of content moderation um, and, and no amount of legislation can take away. As long as we still have access to the internet, as long as we're not under an internet shutdown, which is something that we also need to be aware of. Um, as long as we have that access, let's use it and let's use it to, to build those connections, to raise our voices and to be stronger together. I, I really think that that's, uh, that's the next step in the future. We've learned how to use these tools for ourselves. The governments are quicker than us. They, they respond, um, they take the tools away from us. So now we have each other. And, and so I'm very hopeful in, in that way. Indeed, indeed. Uh, I'll move to Mariam and then Mohammed and then Natalia. Thank you, Manuel. Um, I would say, you know, uh, very quickly on these, um, on what we can do moving forward. Obviously, like, I'm not going to repeat what my colleagues have said, because yes, accountability, yes, uh, seizing to exist in silos and working together, and all of those things. What I would add to that is, uh, we really need to talk about discourse uh, and terminology and who gets to decide and set the discourse and the terminologies, like who gets to decide who's a terrorist, right? Like, what is the difference between the Saudi government beheading uh, people and ISIS beheading people. Why is it that one of them is not allowed access to social media platforms and the other is? And so I think the conversation around who decides what term, what the terminology means and who it's applied to, I think is really important moving forward. The second thing is, um, and this is something that I've been hoping, I've been saying for several years and I'm hoping someone has already or will pick up on it, but I've been saying that one of the things I really hope to see is uh, some sort of universal declaration on digital rights. So the same way that we have a universal declaration on human rights, I think we really need one that speaks specifically about our digital rights because we exist in the digital space almost in the same ways that we exist in the physical space now granted there are there is a large percentage of the world that still don't have access to the internet the way that we do um, and that's a whole other issue that we also need to talk about um, but i do think that we need a foundation like the the part of the reason why we're able to have laws and regulations about everyday human rights is also because we have a foundation to start from and i think for digital rights the same thing is needed we need a universal declaration that sets out what those rights are and what those responsibilities are that need to be protected and from there talk about okay what are the regulations that we need in place what are the laws that we need in place to make sure that those rights are protected i think is extremely important as well Indeed, thank you so much, Mariam. Uh, Nijem? Okay, I noticed earlier that I muted. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so I, I, I just want to add to what's been said is that, I mean, for, for our region, the online space is by default the civic space. So we just need to treat it as such. Uh, and we need to make sure that we we look at all the issues because all of them intersect and also i totally agree with dia that all the regions as well intersect and all the problems are kind of the same from different region so we need to be aware on all of what's happening we need to put the we need to keep putting the puzzle together and keep advocating for the change whether on companies or governments and uh, there's a lot to learn from each other um, we just need to be more nice as well and appreciate what we have for now. And I'm also hopeful. I mean, I don't know why I'm also hopeful. And I will remind everyone that we hope to see Allah free soon. So free Allah. Thank you. Thank you, Nijam. Uh, and the last speaker, Natalia. 
Thank you. Just be very brief. I think it's important for all of us to have events like this to keep talking about these issues and abuses that are still happening in the MENA region. And we saw sort of the original flow of interest and funding and resources during and immediately after the Arab Spring. And now it's sort of the world has sort of moved on in many ways. And I think that's very unfortunate. And we need to keep the attention of the media, of lawmakers and international community on this issue so that people in the region are not forgotten. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I think every time we have this this kind of conversation, I, I feel that we need years and years to just continue um, discussing and, and strategizing on ways forward. Uh, but something I take away from this conversation, uh, and it will inform pretty much all the work that we do at Access Now, solidarity and reclaiming narrative it's and reclaiming the the internet as a space um, that's the the title of the session i we've come to an end so i want to thank you uh thank our speakers for all of their insights and, and expertise and and having the courage to share their uh individual stories so thank you so much and also for our audience um for sticking around with us in the last half uh, hour and a half um, before we conclude and we go and say goodbye, I just want to remind everyone that um, the uh, registration for RightsCon uh, 2021 will open next week. So keep an eye on the RightsCon page and we hope to continue this conversation uh, then in June uh, 2021. Thank you and take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.